are also live. We're talking about clinical research opportunities. Uh, I actually got a question from somebody through email. So there's tons of opportunities. And they're asking about interview, job interview questions. But let me know how you guys are doing. Hi, Adeline. How's it going? Nice to see you on here. Sorry I missed you earlier in the week. But that website's looking good. Randy, how's it going? So let me pull up this question I got. Darshan Talks. How is it? How are you? How's everything, man? It feels like we haven't done an interview in a while, and it's only been a little bit of time. Uh, what's the next mastermind session? Uh, oh, for Patreon? Uh, thanks for reminding me. So I think we're going to do one next week. I'm thinking on Thursday of next week. Haven't haven't uh, officially set it up. Hey, Luisa, how's it going? We just interviewed Luisa last week on Latinos in Clinical Research. So make sure you go check that out. Uh, if you haven't, she's definitely somebody you got to get to know. Noyemi, how's it going? Someone that just reached out, new follower. Welcome, welcome to Guru Nation. And Carla Vera Navas, of course. Uh, World-class entrepreneur. Uh, phase one. I'm still waiting, by the way, on the phase one uh, slides so we can teach our students. Gabby Marinello, another Patreon member. Inquisitive Christine, another Patreon member. Adeline Kumar, another Patreon member. You guys are amazing. Amazing uh, to be surrounded on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, before I get into the questions we got, let me know, of course. Oh, today is the first day in the CRC Academy for the new class. Wow. I need to... Yeah, wow. Uh, I need to talk to Monica about that because I wanted to drop in, but I actually have a Zoom call at the same time. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I'm going to try. I'm going to ask Monica if she can stay on. Like, I'm going to try to come like the last 10 minutes, Adeline. You didn't. You, you heard it from me, okay? I'm going to tell Monica that I'm going to try to get on. Um, so, hey, hey, Deep D, how's it going? We just did an interview also. Uh, with Deep D, so it's like familiar faces all around on a Wednesday. And let's get to this question because there's so many opportunities. And if you guys have questions on Instagram, put them there in between your putting hearts on the screen. And then same thing on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. In between your liking, you have to like. I mean, what kind of a video, what kind of a live stream is it if we're not liking and so let me know what you guys think about that. Let me know how you like it. Make sure you subscribe as well or follow if you haven't. Um, okay, so let's get to the question. Gazelle, how's it going? How's it going? You're, you're the CRA Academy motivator, the motivational expert. So, hey, Dan, I got uh, – I need your help in nailing down some interviews. Need some answers for these questions. So they're saying the first question, experience used with ECRF. Please describe briefly any type of ECRF forms you have used. So there's only a few, right? Metadata Rave is the big one. We use in the CRA Academy the Bioclinica. So Bioclinica is one that we use. Uh, Aviva actually has their own EDC. Uh, and then there's a bunch of like smaller ones after that. Oracle has one, then there's smaller ones. RedCap, I don't think RedCap is an EDC system. Let me know in the comments if RedCap is an EDC system. I don't think they have that. Uh, their second question is, if a new molecule is to be used at, an, at a site for a clinical trial, what information does a patient need to be given? Please describe stepwise. So they need to know in the informed consent, they need to give a description of the results from previous studies. So if it's animal studies, we need to give results. What are the toxicity levels that they think? Uh, if there is human studies, obviously they have more information to give. Like they have maximum tolerated dose and then they have 
hopefully below the maximum tolerated dose, what is the minimal effective dose that they think. So those are some of the things. You need to read the book, The Comprehensive Guide to Clinical Research. We are um, actually translating that book in Spanish, the thanks to Monica. And by the way, I did... Uh, so somebody said a red cap is an EDC, mainly used in academia, from what I've learned. Okay, so red cap is an EDC system. Uh, that's why I've never really used it. I've heard of REDCap. I just thought it was a place for them to put like electronic uh, medical records. Uh, will artificial intelligence and machine learning disrupt the clinical research industry? I mean, I think it's going to disrupt every industry, right? The question is when. Clinical research, I think, is far from that happening. We can't even get site payments on time. Um how are we going to get AI to disrupt our industry? I mean, look, you've heard me say this before. At the end of the day, patience. Well, this industry is nothing without patience, right? And without study volunteers. So I don't see how AI is going to solve that problem of getting patients interested in research. And then once they're in the study, keeping them in the study. So doing our best to retain them. So... As far as disruption from that aspect, which is the most important aspect of clinical research, no, not even, I don't think, in my lifetime. Now, will it disrupt things like monitoring, protocol design, study startup? Possibly. But we're far from that. Very far from that. No, no, t no need to worry about this right now. Worry about more important things, like becoming a generalist. We, I did the first, my first ever Spanish interview today. I was thankfully not, um, yeah, yeah, Lucia, we are uh, doing, Monica and Judy from Latinos in Clinical Research are translating the Comprehensive Guide to Clinical Research in Spanish, and they're also going to do the audio book. And I actually was a co-host today on Latinos in Clinical Research. Um, the entire interview was in Spanish. And I asked some questions. It was my first ever, like, on-camera Spanish. I understood 90% of the conversation, so that was good. And then I asked a few questions. Um, okay, back to this person's question. So type of EDC system, so we've discussed. If a new molecule, what patient information needs to be given. So all that stuff that I described, safety data, needs to be on the informed consent as far as the new medication, right? The investigational product. Their third question is, what do you find most interesting and challenging in research? I can't answer this question for you. When they ask you stuff like this, they're not, they don't actually care what you say for the most part. They care that, or they want to see that you have your finger on the pulse of the industry. So you have to say something that I mean, you, you have to actually say something you find interesting and challenging, but they want to see if you're current. I think I heard, I keep plugging Latinos in Clinical Research, but yesterday on Latinos in Clinical Research in our webinar, by the way, we gave out to the people who joined, we gave out the contest rules for the CRA Academy Scholarship. So you had to have been there live for that webinar. All ethnicities welcome. We only had 40 people on. So... One of those 40 is going to win the scholarship, and it could have been you. So make sure you don't miss out on the next giveaway next month. We're doing another giveaway. You have to subscribe to latinosinclinicalresearch.com so that you get the uh, email of when the webinars are going to be. All right, so question number three, what do you find most interesting and challenging in research? you got to figure that out. Do the work on that. I don't know what you find interesting. I know if they asked me that, I would say right now I'm interested in diversity in clinical research. Matter of fact, we started a group of Latinos in clinical research, and this is what we're doing. And I also find interesting CRISPR. I'm reading three books on CRISPR right now, and I'm actually reviewing. I'm doing some videos on CRISPR and interviewing experts. That's my authentic answer. If I gave that in an interview, I mean, I don't know if they like it or not, but that's my answer. And um, so I can't help you with your question, with that question. And number four, describe relevant experience to the position you're applying. So this, they're looking for transferable skills. So whatever position you're at, you have to really know and understand the job description. 
and then you got to figure out reverse engineer that job description back into what you what skill set you have it's exactly what we talked about yesterday on Latinos in Clinical Research webinar. You have to be there. You've got to be there. If you missed that one, you could watch the replay. It's an hour long on Latinos in Clinical Research YouTube channel. But we don't put we haven't posted the rules for the CRA Academy scholarship because you had to be there live for that one. You had to be there live. Um Naomi says, I work for small pharma, does everything in house, so our IT made their own that was fun to explain to an interview. Exactly. But see, you're a generalist. The more, and I don't know if that was you messaging me that yesterday. I remember reading it. I didn't reply. I'm behind. I'm behind on emails. If I miss one, I apologize, guys. Like sometimes I'll read them and not reply. I'll just think about, think about the answer and then I'll get distracted with something else. But being a generalist uh has tremendous ROI return on your investment. Hello T4 now, Cami, Sholape, Connor. How's it going? You guys put some hearts on there. Let me know your questions. Let me know what you guys are thinking uh in the comments. I watched the replay of the webinar last night. Very informative and insightful. Thank you, Just Preet. I really appreciate it. Uh hey Dan, just joined. Please share your thoughts about decentralized trials and its effect on clinical research jobs. I think it's going to increase uh, clinical research jobs. Christine, Inquisitive Christine put SWAT team. That's right. I have done in my career, I've been involved in two SWAT-related um, situations as a contractor. So basically what SWAT is is they hire you. You're like a hired gun when a site is in trouble or like let's say they're about to get FDA audited or the sponsor suspects like just either fraud or just bad data collection they send the SWAT people in so you learn the protocol like in a day they actually pay you a lot they pay you a lot for those things um, but it's a lot of work too and you go and basically fix the problem this is this is why I'm telling you guys be generalist. Not necessarily so you do SWAT, but you have options. See, the whole thing about being a generalist is that it gives you options. He or she who has options is in a better situation than he or she who does not. That should be a quote. I got to actually start getting Chanel to do more quotes. Um, but that's a quote. Also, SWAT team, like Christine says, is a quote as well. Hey, Naomi. How's it going? We have a Naomi and we have a No Noemi. Um, both watching. One on Instagram, one on LinkedIn. So as far as decentralized trials, I think it's adding more studies that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. I don't think it's taking away from the regular studies that they would have done anyways. I think they're able to do faster studies uh <laughs> in a decentralized manner they could collect some data but I think the traditional studies are never going away I think that's growing as well so this is why like it's the perfect wave right now decentralized trials its effect on clinical research jobs this is going to add more jobs more remote jobs obviously and oh for uh, CRC jobs um, it's not going to affect a clinical research coordinator because you still need a coordinator and coordinators are already in short supply and all you're doing is adding more studies and even if those coordinators don't are not needed for those studies because they only need one coordinator maybe the coordinators are going to be plenty busy with all the other studies decentralized trial for those that don't know is when there really are no sites everything is done virtually so Patients are mailed their drug. Patients are mailed the EKG machines. Uh, phlebotomist goes to the patient home to draw blood. Nurse goes to do physicals. PI meets the patient on Zoom or something similar to Zoom. It's it's just it's in its infancy. The the centralized trials and there's this fear that it's going to replace traditional trials and I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think 
it's going to be done for like more for like observational type of studies, to be honest with you, because patients need to be compliant. And I think what we're going to see is hybrid trials, patients being allowed to come to the office or allowed to do it at their home. But you're not replacing the site in those cases, whereas in a true decentralized trial, you are replacing the site. Um, are decentralized trials more common now for COVID trials? No. Traditional trials are COVID trials. Decentralized trials, you're seeing for like mainly like, not mainly, but for a lot of observational studies, a lot of easier trials with less assessments. Have you heard of any long-term COVID studies? Yeah, there's a couple right now. One of them's not paying the sites. I wrote an article on that one. Romark is the sponsor, and they owe a bunch of sites a bunch of money. And go to my YouTube channel and just see the last video I have uploaded this morning. It's about that. So hopefully that answers your question. Anybody else have... Uh, questions let me know uh, traditional studies are never going away that's what I was looking for well I'm glad I'm glad I'm uh, in the business of providing comfort uh, but I really believe that is it confirmation bias maybe you guys have to do your own due diligence I mean you have to learn these things and have your own, form your own opinions just like this person who asked me how should she answer what is what she finds interesting and challenging about clinical research? I have no idea how to answer that question. Does anybody have answers for her? I don't have answers. I can tell you what I would say, but that's me. They're, if they follow up, if you just copy what I'm going to say and they follow up and you, you don't know anything about it, you're going to get caught. Plug Clubhouse. Oh, that's right. So Friday night, so go to Clubhouse. Join my club, Guru Nation. Find me, Dan Sfera. Hit follow. Find Inquisitive Christine. Hit follow. And be ready for Friday night, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Mixer. And then Monday night with Marjorie from Topaz Clinical Research, also under Guru Nation. Keeping it real in research. And... I think Latinos in clinical research are going to start doing a um, career coaching night on Clubhouse, but we'll announce something in the next four weeks. Um, why can't a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company set up its own CRO? Should a site owner or small CRO owner be worried about this in the future? The main reason is they can't, first of all, Pharmaceutical companies, their core competency is not um, CRO stuff, and even less so site stuff. So first of all, pharma company won't need a CRO. If they really want to do the study themselves, they just do it. And you have maybe 15 to 20% of sponsors manage their own studies. Like they just contract out to CRAs, but they manage it directly. So they don't need the CRO part. Why do they don't have the site part? There are laws against sponsors direct involvement with patients and so you're always going to need the sites for that the sites are going to be impossible to replace in our lifetimes anybody watching this um, even if decentralized trials becomes like the thing which it's very unlikely that that's gonna make more patients enroll and and on top of that pharma i know they gained a lot of trust from the public with covid with the vaccines and all that um, they might be losing some more of that now with the Johnson and Johnson news and the AstraZeneca news, but they're traditionally one of the most distrusted industries out there. So who do patients trust? They trust their doctor, their physician, their clinicians. That's who the sites are. The sites are clinicians. Um, so I wouldn't be worried about that. If that was a possibility, it would have happened already. What are some of the most common questions you find that the study team and PIs ask during an SIV? They usually ask things very specific to the protocol. Like, what do we do at this visit? Can you explain here in the protocol where it says we have to do this at visit two? 
can we do this instead at visit one? They ask things like that at SAV. It's very protocol specific. They don't really ask any general kind of things. Um, you have to know the protocol at the SAV. If you're the CRA, you really have to know the protocol. Uh, no Yemi says, I just interviewed with one of the big CROs, kind of intimidated going from a smaller sponsor to a big CRO. Been hearing the work-to-life balance is bad. Yeah, especially when you're new. At a CRO, the quality of life and work-life balance is much better at a sponsor. Although at smaller sponsors, yes, it's still better. The big CROs, and they're, they, they're doing a slightly better job at this because... They want to retain more of their employees. It's very hard to retain employees. Um, they're trying to improve this, but at the end of the day, their business model is days on site for CRAs, and there's just no way around that. What are some of the most common questions you find that the study... Okay, I asked that one. I have my first SIV tomorrow, not remote. So yeah, if you're the CRA... Know the protocol really well because the clinicians have to join and the clinicians like to ask a lot of clinical stuff. And you don't want your answer to every question to be, I'll have to get back to you. I have to ask the sponsor. I mean, if you truly don't know, yes. But you should have some answers to you. Um, okay. Oh, I just got an email that one of my sites randomized someone. Great. It's busy, guys. It's busy. Um, regarding challenges in clinical research would suggest adding how you would rise to the challenge or a potential solution instead of just stating the challenge yep exactly exactly so take it from deep D right there how do you create source document templates do you customize the source document based on the study ECRF yes you should ask because sites have to create their own source now. Well, not now. For like the last 10 years, it's been common. So you need to ask for a screenshot of the EDC of every visit. And that shows you everything that needs to be captured. And then you need to know the protocol and you need to know what order the assessments need to be done in. And that's how you create your source template. But just with Microsoft Word. Any advice for new CRAs? Know the protocol. Know the protocol and document very well. Over document on your trip reports if you have to. Let them tell you to be less detailed. What do you think is more stressful, clinical PM or CRA? It depends on you. Um, if you like to travel, I mean, you definitely get plenty of travel as a CRA. Um, if you are an organized person, I think PM is good. If you don't like travel, you don't have to travel as much. To me, I would probably, it depends which one I would pick. I mean, honestly, I think I could be successful in both. And I haven't really given it much thought as to which one I would prefer. I'd probably prefer CRA. PMs, yeah, PMs, PMs are, I deal with a lot, a lot. Whenever, when, when any stakeholder in a study gets upset, they call the PM. Or they email the PM. Can you just download or print the ECRF from the EDC and use it as a source document? No. Um, because they're not very print friendly. Uh, I mean, I suppose you can. There's no rule stating you can't. But nobody does that. Uh, it's better to just create the template on a Word document. Um, oh, Gazelle says comfortable shoes and clothes for a new CRA. This is true. She also gave this advice in our CRA Academy guest lecture. So, yeah. Any other questions, everybody? A lot of opportunities going on. Look, one of my sites, someone just got randomized. All in the 20 minutes of doing this live stream. One of my other sites, somebody's screened. I'm seeing it right now happening live in front of me. Latinos in clinical research is searching for grade schools to network with. That's right. And uh, Inquisitive Christine 
the person we interviewed today, um, four Latinas in clinical research, 100% in Spanish. So if you want to watch me speaking Spanish, go to Latinas in clinical research YouTube channel. It'll be on there in 10 minutes. Um, he has a podcast. He has like 6,000 subscribers. He has a science-based uh, podcast, and he has like 6,000 subscribers on there. And and they're all mostly college or high school age subscribers. So we're, we're definitely trying to reach breakthrough to that market. We're trying to get the next generation of researchers to become aware of research so that they don't just fall, you know, so that like the small percentage of them just luck into it. Most people just luck into it or stumble into research. We want to make it so people are actively aware of research as a career because it's a great career. Any other tips for new CRA? Just know the protocol. Know the protocol. That's like the biggest thing you can do. And patient safety, like inclusion, exclusion criteria, you really got to know that. What's the opportunity in Canada? Canada's uh, tough. It's a tough market. There are opportunities in Canada. You need to do a lot of networking if you're in Canada. Uh, next month, I'm actually speaking at a Canadian conference. I think it's the Association of Canadian Clinical Researchers or something. And I'm actually talking about how to break into the industry. If you're in Canada, you better be networking. LinkedIn and Clubhouse. And and then in the comments like you are now, but just network like you have to do it double than the Americans because you have less opportunities there. Doesn't mean there are not any opportunities there. It means there's less and you gotta do more. Do you have any advice for that interview? Uh what interview? I'm not sure. I am seeking to network with Latin American researchers. Yeah. Uh let's see here. On a long run, do you suggest the coordinator to take a license of a phlebotomist or a nursing assistant to avoid hiring, contracting different specialties, uh, specialists? Yeah, I think um, in re every state has a, its own law of when a phlebotomy license is required. In California, it's like if you do a thousand or more blood draws a month, I think is the number. So in research, we don't do at my small sites that so we have medical assistants or lvns that draw the blood um, the coordinators also get trained on that if they want to some don't have you ever tried using excel to build an automatic ecfr sdr checking system nope that would not be a task for me at all that sounds interesting though i would be interested in somebody who has done that i work for a pharmaceutical company and they have a clinical research department and we are only eight field monitors here the good thing about that is we do everything so i feel like i have experience in a lot of the clinical research aspects also my name is pronounced no emmy oh okay thank you no emmy um yeah being a generalist is gonna pay make sure you're putting all of that skill set on your cv don't just assume people know, oh, you work for that sponsor, so they make them do everything. Put everything that you do, even if it's beyond your job description, on your CV. That's the only way they're going to know. No, Emmy. Uh, where and how do you maintain pre-screening data of subjects? I'm referring to pre-screening, which uh, we could do it in the um, EMR, in the clinician's EMR. And then we have our own uh, database that we use Excel for that. But we're looking to upgrade that to something else. Just haven't found what that's going to be. Excel, it's kind of tough to beat Excel sometimes. And uh, let's go, last question. Any advice on how to look for full-time CRA positions, need visa and sponsorship? Honestly, I have no experience. Well, I have very limited experience with visas and sponsorships. That obviously throws uh, a monkey wrench into the whole CRA job hunt. I think you shouldn't limit yourself if you're in that situation to just CRA. I think sites are in need, especially if you're like a foreign medical graduate. Sites would hire you. We've hired many IMGs and we have sponsored them at the site level as our coordinators. So I have like limited experience like on one hand. 
of how many people we've done this for. The CROs, I don't know. I think, I mean, they're desperate for people, but I don't know the whole visa and sponsorship thing for CROs uh, when it comes to that. I will have a second interview for CRC position. They asked me to present informed consent to a site director. Do you have any advice for that interview? Uh, yeah, go on my YouTube channel and look at the process of consent video. Just search on my YouTube channel, Dan Sfera, process of consent. And I like go through exactly what that entails. Uh, just don't be nervous. No, understand the process of consent. Understand the patient understands what they're getting into. Be very detailed with the patient. Um, patient with them. Question about follow-up visits. Do sites use any tool software to remind them of the subject follow-up visits? Due to many subjects with different follow-up dates and it's easy to get confused. So sometimes the EDC will remind you. Other times the IWRS will remind you. Other times you just have to make a calendar to remind yourself. That's what we use at our sites as a calendar, a shared calendar. Where we have the subject initials and what visit they're due for. So it doesn't have to be complicated. In uh, some of the eSource systems like Creo they do have uh, this option and it will actually automatically text them clinicalresearch.io yeah see Louisa says she uses her calendar to do a recurrent meeting exactly uh, in your opinion what is the best career growth for medical doctors into clin ops starting out as CRA so CRA Probably lead CRA or clinical trial manager, or you can go project manager route. Um, that's the best career growth for you. It depends where you're trying to get out of it. I know if it's higher salary, uh, you can go independent contractor and make really good money being an independent contractor. It's a little riskier because the projects come and go, but in a year like this year, it's way better. All right, guys, got to end this because I got another call coming up. But uh, be on the lookout for the Latinos in Clinical Research video. And uh, catch you guys later. Bye-bye.